Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to the Scottish Parliament, to your Scottish Parliament, and to this, and to this Scotland's Women Gath Her event. And a special thank you to Edinburgh Piper Louise Marshall for her fabulous performance as we all arrived this morning. I think that deserves a round of applause. Today, we gather to explore how we women in Scotland can be motivated, encouraged and supported to stand for positions of elected representation at every opportunity, in every area, in our communities, in our local government areas and nationally. And the Scottish Parliament and elector are very, very pleased to be working in partnership again to deliver this unique event for women across Scotland. And as well as those of us gathered here in person today, this event reaches out across Scotland. We're joined live by women from five participation hubs in Aberdeen. Let's say hello, Aberdeen. Hello, Aberdeen. <laughs> Do join me. In Argyll and Butte. Hello, Argyll and Butte. In Inverclyde. Hello, Inverclyde. In Perth and Kinross. Hello, Perth and Kinross. And in Shetland. Hello, Shetland. Warm welcome to you all. Today, we're going to hear from inspiring speakers. Our macker, Kathleen Jamie, has written a piece especially for us and especially for today. And a cross-party panel of elected women will join us for a question and answer session about getting involved in politics, about their journey. And we also have fabulous musical performances to look forward to later in the day. Next year, this parliament will be celebrating its 25th anniversary. And we received the very sad news on Thursday that Winnie Ewing, an MSP, an MP, an MEP, an inspiring political leader, and the first person to chair this parliament had passed away. And you will have read many tributes and seen iconic photos and footage on TV. But on the 12th of May, 1999, Winnie chaired that first meeting and announced the Scottish Parliament, which adjourned on the 25th of March, 1707, is hereby reconvened. Four principles were central to the vision for our Parliament, openness, accountability, the sharing of power and equal opportunities. The ambition for working practices and facilities that support equal participation has always been there. The recently reopened creche was, at the time of its introduction, the first of its kind in Europe, the first in any European Parliament. And parliamentary recess dates here are scheduled very much to try to fit in with, with school holidays, with family life, as far as possible. But almost 25 years on, those founding principles continue to underpin the work of this parliament and its members. Now, the parliament continues to strive to build on its ambition to secure equal opportunities, to reflect all people of Scotland. There is progress, but there's still much to be done. In this sixth session of the Scottish Parliament, 46% of our MSPs are women notably by some way the highest percentage elected since 1999. <laughs> Women hold key roles in our parliament. Women are committee conveners, members of the corporate body, members of the parliamentary bureau, and indeed presiding officers. But we cannot be complacent. We cannot take this progress for granted. We absolutely must challenge ourselves to continue on that path of positive change. And you may be aware that over the last year we've undertaken what's known as a gender sensitive audit, an audit to take a broad look at barriers to equal representation and participation in the work of the parliament. And the board comprised representatives from each of the political parties in the parliament External experts and parliamentary officials led the audit and carefully considered the evidence. And 
We heard from witnesses from all walks of life, from all communities across Scotland, and our, our report, A Parliament for All, was published in March. And the audit showed that there had been fluctuations over time in the number of women in leadership and decision-making roles. So we know the equal representation of women is not yet embedded within the Parliament, and nor is it guaranteed going forward. We took some snapshots of what was going on in the Chamber, for example, and the audit found that women are notably less likely to intervene in debates than men, less likely to participate in First Minister's question time. And it remains the case that women tend to be underrepresented in some committees and in important leadership roles. But this can and must change. So our cross-party recommendations, they look at the culture, the processes and the facilities in this parliament. They're designed to strengthen equal representation and participation at Holyrood. It's one thing to have 46% of women in the chamber, but it's another thing to make sure that that representation is fully reflected in participation. So having women in key roles and ensuring they're properly represented across the parliament helps bring different voices and perspectives to decisions. I mean, it's really important that for whoever is chairing this parliament, they look out and they see Scotland in all its glorious diversity represented in these seats. So our cross-party recommendations include rule changes to guarantee more equal representation on key bodies and groups, such as the Parliamentary Bureau that I mentioned that decides the political activity that's taking place, and the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. We've established a forum for women MSPs to discuss issues of mutual interest. We've had our first meeting where we looked at social media and the impact that can have on women in politics, and I'm sure you'll be only too well aware that it's not always the positive tool that we'd like it to be. We're having a look at the Parliament's sitting times, how they fluctuate and how we can try to limit that unpredictability as possible. Parliaments are always going to have to, you know, there's going to be times where you have to change business at short notice because of what's happening. But we have to make sure that we guarantee predictability as far as possible so that those who are looking after elderly parents or young children have got some certainty and they can engage and they can see themselves as members in this chamber. And we're looking at the, well, we're currently piloting a proxy voting scheme, which will be permanently introduced in due course, and that will cover parental leave, illness and caring and bereavement leave. But this report is only the first step towards substantive reform. We're about to establish a group which will take this work forward to make sure this progress continues. We're not just going to put this report on the shelf and say, job done, far from it. And as we begin to implement these recommendations, I believe that they have the power to bring about the change that we need over the short, medium and longer term. But today is about you. It's about your hopes and ideas. I hope that this event will inspire you to perhaps stand for electoral, elected positions, to stand again and again until there's equal opportunities, equal representation across our community councils, in our youth parliament, in our local councils, and here in the Scottish Parliament. We need democratic institutions that truly reflect who we are as a nation. We have to encourage women who are passionate about representative democracy women of all ages, backgrounds, experiences and situations to take your place in representing the interests and needs of your communities and influencing change in Scotland. Thank you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Talat Yacoub. Now, I have had the pleasure of working with Talat at, at various points, and I've always been struck by her commitment. And Talat, as you may well know, is a third sector leader, writer, and campaigner who's focused on equality issues across politics, public life, and the labour market, in particular, championing women, communities of colour, and migrants. Talat. Thank you, Presiding Officer, for the introduction and thank you to um, Elector for the kind invitation to be able to speak to you all today. 
Um, I had the opportunity to do this um, in 2019 when Electra had their first uh, event, and I said it then, and I say it now, what a brilliant looking parliament. <laughs> Now, in the work I do, a lot of it is about influencing decision makers, influencing those with power, and I can tell you most of my meetings don't look like this. And that desperately needs to change. But, but because of that, that's why events like this are so soul-nourishing. They give you a space of hope, they give you a space of solidarity, they give you a space of thinking, well, things might just be able to be different, provided we work together towards that common goal. So, um, as has been introduced, um, I uh, am a campaigner and I have been working for a long time on across issues around women and girls equality and particularly understanding that women are not a homogenous group and that within that, women of colour, uh, disabled women, working class women uh, and those at the intersections in between, including LGBT women, are more likely to be furthest away from access to opportunity, power and wealth. And anything we do has to respond understanding that there are women specifically in certain groups that have the least power and we have to be able to focus on them and ensure that the ladder does not go up behind the few women that have made it to the top. Um, I uh, founded uh, Women 5050 after the independence referendum in 2014. And it didn't matter what side of that independence referendum you were on. Um, it was about a surge of political interest in Scotland, a surge of political commentary and narrative and discussions happening around the dinner table. And um, a group of us came together and thought, well, how do we channel this into something that brings all sides together and advances women's inequality? And whenever we talked about, well, what could that thing be? We could be advocating for different issues. I've worked on women's labour market equality, their underrepresentation in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, violence against women and girls, the issue of um, black women's maternal health, for example. All of these issues require space. They require campaigning. But we started thinking about who is it we'd be directing our campaigning to? What do they look like? What do they know? What are their stories and their lived experience? And that's where we thought about, actually, we need to bring back the campaign to have 50% at least representation of women in the Scottish Parliament. When the Parliament was first reconvened in 1999, there was a, a, a huge push by uh, trade union women to ensure that women were represented in the Scottish Parliament. And at that time, we actually had, again, at that time, the highest number of women elected to any UK Parliament. However, since then, it actually decreased two elections later, illustrating the fact that actually a win at one time is not necessarily lasting change and systemic change over the long term. So we created Women 5050 again, and like most things in my life, it was created uh, via email in coffee shops over conversations that were uh, essentially angry rants. And that's been how most things in my life have started. When I, um, Women 5050 is primarily about legislated candidate quotas. And the reason it's about legislated candidate quotas is because we know that voluntary measures only go so far. Because we're looking for voluntary measures by people who have power. And the people who have power are those who do not look like this parliament necessarily. So we advocate for legislated candidate quotas, which would mean every political party had to pursue 50% candidates legislated for to make sure that the candidates that were running in elections, 50% of them were women and women from diverse backgrounds. We're still fighting for that, but we do have uh, over half of the current Scottish Parliament on our side to try and pursue that. And the majority of political parties on our side to pursue that too. Since 2019, um, when I gave this speech at the, the first uh, event of this kind, uh, a lot has changed. That's a long time in politics. Um, and not only has a lot changed in politics, but um, so have the increasing number of uh, wrinkles, frown lines and grey hairs that I have uh, since 2019, largely trying to work around volatile politics. So hopefully I won't put you completely off by the time I finish this speech. I'm going to break you down and then lift you back up. It'll be fine. But since 2019, we have had a 
local election that has seen the highest number of women elected in local councils. We've had a national election which saw the first women of colour elected to the Scottish Parliament, the first permanent wheelchair user elected to the Scottish Parliament, and I am genuinely so delighted that they're both in this room because I have a lot of admiration for them both. But I'm sure they'll agree with me in that we'd like to see a world where we aren't still talking about firsts. We'd like to see a world where we aren't celebrating the first time something has happened in groundbreaking moment in 2023. Surely we should be beyond that by now. Yeah. So we need to go further. We need to go faster. We need to be bolder. We need to be unapologetic in our pursuit of progress and equality for women. It took... 21 years, 22 years of the Scottish Parliament, elect, um, Scottish Parliament to be existing for the first women of colour to be in Parliament. We've also not had any women or actually any individuals from the black community as elected representatives in the Scottish Parliament. That's simply not good enough. So there is far to go and far too often we are still talking about firsts and we need to get beyond that. I remember when um, I was, uh, the, the 2021 election had happened and I was asked by different newspaper outlets, media outlets to come and, and give my take on what I thought of the first women of colour being in Parliament. Isn't this remarkable? Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this a sign of significant progress? And everything I would say was, yes, but. Yes, it's a, a sign of progress. But is it progress that we should still be applauding to such an extent when it's progress that should have happened decades ago? So I, I'm not the easiest person to interview for media. The soundbite doesn't really work when I am both um, celebrating and then cynical. So um, the 30 second sound clip doesn't work quite as well with me uh, when I want to be a little bit more nuanced about the reality for women in politics. Progress has been made, but progress has been often superficial and nothing illustrated that more than the pandemic. The COVID-19 and the consequences that we saw that had a disproportionate impact on women, women who were more likely to lose paid work, women who were more likely to take on disproportionate levels of unpaid care and become unpaid carer and, and lose access to income, women and girls from marginalised backgrounds, from uh, communities of colour, disproportionately more likely to be in front-facing, low-paid work that had to go out and keep us safe during COVID-19. So whilst we talk about change and we applaud progress, we have to acknowledge that progress is, has not created the systemic change, the long-lasting, sustainable change that is critical to women and girls' lives. And when I say women and girls' lives, I mean from all backgrounds, all inclusive women and girls' lives. We saw the marginalization continue through the cost of living crisis. We're seeing that now, that women are more likely to be in increasing levels of debt, that women are more likely to be in need of public services that are still recovering from COVID-19, and that women are more likely to be the ones supporting other women in those public services despite their demand, despite the lack of access to funding and sustainable resource. For us to make a difference in who gets to be in this chamber, in local council chambers, we have to do something about the lives that marginalised women and girls have before they even think about politics being for them. We have to think about the um, impact of poverty we have to think about the intersections of racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, classist, ableist abuse and what that means for the systems that we create and what consequences that has for women. Until we do that, the fight for representation will be a fight we continually have to take unless we do something about the systemic issues that prevent women from thinking that this room is not just not for them, but maybe even not talking about them. We have to do something about systemic change. Um, as a consequence of this, because um, I have a lot of spare time, uh, just after, uh, I don't have a lot of spare time, um, <laughs> just after uh, the elector event in 2019, I started something called Pass the Mic, which some of you might be aware of. Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's, 
there was a, a, a couple of whoops in the room, and I'm assuming that means because some of the women who are in Pass the Mic are here today, and I can see one there, that's great. Um, I started Pass the Mic, and Pass the Mic um, was a reflection of what was needed, uh, I feel, in Scotland at the time, uh, because I could complain about an issue or I could try and make that issue better. So I decided to do that. Um, and it is specifically for women of colour in Scotland. We have 2021 had the first two women of colour um, represented in the Scottish Parliament. But what we do see is that in media, in expertise, uh, on panels, uh, when we are asking for commentary that is building the picture of politics, women of colour are very much missing. So I had an Excel spreadsheet on my uh, laptop, which was the um, women of colour that I know and all their expertise um, to share um, with media whenever they would ask me to, to comment on something. I would say, but what about this person? And what about this person? I'll give you their details. And I realised that not enough change was happening there. So in October 2019, I started Pass the Mic, which is an online website. And if you're a woman of colour in this room right now, it doesn't matter what your expertise are. The expertise could be personal. They could be in your professional life. They might be as a carer. They might be as a parent. They might be as a guardian. They might be um, the experience of poverty and inequality. And it might be because you are an astrophysicist, of which there are two on the directory. Um, please don't ask me what that actually involves. I have no idea. But um, it went from being a few women that I, I know and I've, and I've engaged with and recommended to being currently over 200 women of colour experts on the website for events organisers, media, commentary to get in touch with, to amplify and elevate their voices and their expertise. It's 200. By the end of the year, I'd like to see 300. So if you're in this room, make sure that you sign up to that. But the point of doing that is because we need interventions that make a difference. We need interventions that create tangible change. And the same thing is required within politics. We need not only women in the chambers and in the, the corridors of power, and I've said this last time and I'll say it again, we need feminists, we need anti-racists, we need anti-poverty advocates, we need people who genuinely want to see progress happen in Scotland for all and those who are marginalised. Because it's not enough just to be in this room, it's what you do for the women who are outside of this room that matters. One of the things that I uh, struggle with the most is when I talk to people about uh, women being involved in politics, um, one of the things that I hear the most is actually maybe we don't want to be involved in it because we hear about the abuse, we hear about the discriminatory cultures, we hear about it, it being exclusionary, we hear about the toxicity involved. And unfortunately, and I have to be honest, um, and I said I'd, I'd, I'd let you drop and then I'll, I'll help you rise, I will do that, I promise. But unfortunately, that is on the increase. As a consequence of social media, as a consequence of polarised debate, the level of toxicity is, is on the rise. And we have to, have to, take responsibility for that. Every political party has to take responsibility for that and create a space where abuse is not tolerated and that abuse is not a feature of Scottish politics. That is particularly important for marginalised women who at the, at the intersections often experience racist, sexist um, abuse. And that is critical, that we have to stand up against that. And we have to ensure that every woman from all backgrounds, all individuals of progressive backgrounds, are able to participate in politics in a way that is free from abuse, free from inequality, and free from disdain. We have to create more trust in politics too. A lot of the time we have seen trust in politics decrease, particularly we are seeing higher levels of mistrust in politics by young people and those who already experience marginalisation. So it is our, the duty of political parties and the duty of our parliament and our councils to tackle that feeling of mistrust and do more to develop trust, enable trust and encourage not just for doors to be open for people to participate in, but for them to feel fully welcome when they do come through the door. And it's really important to call things what they are. It's important to call out the inequalities and it's important to create solidarity between marginalised communities. What Women50 does is count the numbers, sure. We count the number of, of women who are running for election. 
uh, and the diversities and intersections of those women that are um, running for election. We count who's in Parliament. But beyond that, we want to see a Parliament that delivers for women and girls in policy and in systems and structure change. The gender-sensitive audit that the um, presiding officer mentioned is a way to count some of those women. But what struck me in that report the most was not just that when women are in this space, that uh, the counting the women that are in this space, but also the experience of women when they are in the chamber and they are speaking. Because correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was women who were disproportionately more likely to take uh, interventions from others compared to men in the chamber. So they were more willing to yield their time to hear from others than what men were in the chamber. So that tells you about the difference in which the culture plays out in this room. So there has to be an accountability for that culture too. And I look forward to the gender sensitive audit delivering um, on its recommendations and um, also working hard to tackle the inequalities that marginalise women with intersecting inequalities face when trying to be part of this chamber. It is imperative that we think not only about what happens when somebody's a councillor and when somebody's an MSP, we think about the barriers that stop them from getting there or thinking politics is for them in the first place and what happens when they reach that space. In 2021, in the Scottish Parliament elections, we saw a, a number of women who had been elected decide to not restand. And they talked about the experiences they had. They talked about the fact that they didn't think this was compatible with their caring responsibilities. They didn't think it was compatible because of the level of abuse or inequality they faced, or the fact that they had to travel from being far, from further away. They talked about that, and the consequences of that is that we encourage women to come in, but then we create a revolving door where they don't stay. So the culture also is critical and needs to change. We can do that. There are organisations like Elect Her that are working on that. There's Women 5050 working on that. There's the Equal Representation Toolkit within gender working on culture change. That's what we need to see. And I know that um, having conversations with the presiding officer and the, the group involved in the gender sensitive audit, that there is the want to do that. We need political will right across this chamber, right across every party to make that a reality. Politics can be and has often proven itself to be a source of good. It can create social good. It can create social change and it can be a progressive beacon. The more people from more diverse backgrounds that get involved in it, the more likely that is to be the case. So whilst we look to you in this room to hopefully think about standing for election, I hope you also do the accountability side of it, which is contacting political parties, contacting councils, contacting the parliament itself and asking, what are you doing to create the cultures that mean that women want to participate? So that political will comes, becomes political and parliamentary action. The future is a bright one, even though sometimes it can feel bleak. And there is so much that needs to change for women and girls in Scotland and beyond. The future is a bright one. And the future is theirs for us to take. And what I would say is, rather than asking for permission, demanding our space is the best way to do it. Thank you for... Thank you again for giving me an opportunity on a Saturday to be in such a wholesome space uh, and to forget uh, for a little while the meetings I'm going to have to endure Monday through to Friday that don't look like this. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope it's soul nourishing. I hope you build contacts. And most importantly, I hope you think about how you extend the ladder to more women that hopefully will come behind you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Talat. I think you've set our day off to a fabulous start and it's very much appreciated. I am now delighted to invite Scotland's macker, Kathleen Jamie, to perform her poem, Her Words. Kathleen. Thank you. A poem called Her Words, which incorporates as many words as I could cram in, which contain the words she and her. Her words. Whether she sells seashells on the seashore, or braves all weathers on a heathery sheep farm, 
or changes sheets, or can read a diathermometer, or operate on hernias. Whether she can put up a shelf with a power drill, gut a herring, tell an anther from a stamen, or install your ethernet cable, or hold P7 to attention with sheer charisma. Whether or no she's a mother, or whether dolled up in fake lashes and shellac nails, enjoys a wee bit retail therapy, or would rather cherish hours in her potting shed. Or maybe she's a sea bather, or one who dashes hither and thither, hudding it all together, and never gets fashed, never gets into a lather, who stands still as a heron, the kind of woman we turn to for shelter when everything's an ashe of ashes, and we just need a blether and a breather over a sherry or a herbal infusion or a sherbet dab, whatever. Whether she hails from Shetland or Motherwell, Harriet or Herat, Anstruther or Achnasheen, Shendi or Rutherglen, if she knows she's not here to feather her own nest, but rather to listen, consider, maybe dare change her mind rather than dither, usher her in, usher her in. We need her words. We need her voice to be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I feel that says it all, really. And it's a wonderful poem, just perfect for today's event. Um, there'll now be a cross-party panel discussion, and I would invite uh, colleagues to join me in the well of the chamber. Thank you. Can people hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Well, here we are in the well of the chamber with my lovely colleagues. Um, we are joined here with CoCab Stewart MSP, with Tess White MSP, with Maggie Chapman MSP, Councillor Hal Osler and Pam Duncan Glancy MSP. And while colleagues are speaking, because colleagues are going to describe their journey into politics, if any questions come to mind, then I believe you have a, an online tool, Menti, um, and you can start to, to feed your questions into that, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. But what I'm going to do now is ask each member of the panel to share their own journey, how they got involved in politics. And I'm going to begin with CoCap Stewart, MSP, who is a member of the Scottish National Party and the constituency member for Glasgow Kelvin, CoCab. Thank you, Alison. Um, we've only got a few minutes, so the journey sort of started uh, a quarter of a century ago or possibly more. Um, and I first stood in the 1999 Scottish Parliament elections. Um, uh, Donald Dewar uh, won that one, and subsequently I stood again, I think two or three times at least. But in between that, I competed in many selection contests in other petitions uh, for uh, council ac across the, the platforms. Um, the reason why I came into politics was not to be a politician, um, and I still possibly don't class myself as a politician. Um, 29 years as a teacher, I was sort of very uh, dedicated to education, and within that I uh, saw lots of areas that were wonderful, but also areas that needed to be improved. So that was my bit. Prior to that, um, I got involved in student politics as well. 
Um, and in that arena, uh, we were sort of like, uh, well, we were looking at the poll tax uh, in those days because we're going right back to the 80s. And even prior to that, um, in the 80s, uh, a big recession happened and the impact on families and workers. So it was all these injustices, I suppose, that triggered that need to actually find a platform. So going from campaigning at local level and chatting to actually looking at who the decision makers were. And every time I tried to sort of ask somebody to make the change, they said, oh, it's not us that makes that decision, it's somebody else. Um, and then when I got to that level, they said, oh, no, 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 it's not us, it's somebody else. So it turns out that in Scotland, you know, the legislatures are in the Scottish Parliament. Um, so that's what led me to stand as an MSP, so that I could be part of that uh, table, I suppose, that scrutinises legislation and hopefully uh, my influences of fighting injustice um, on various campaigns that I've been involved in, I can put that now to good use. So that's a quick, quick summary of it. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, CoCab. And I'm now going to invite Tess White, MSP, who is a member of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party and a regional member of North East Scotland, to share her journey into politics. Thank you. Tess. Um, can you hear me? So I am a woman of a certain age, so I do need, I do have a few notes in front of me. So I, I just, um, um, so I'm the, um, on the region list, got in through the region list in the North East, um, Conservative uh, Member of Parliament for the North East and Shadow Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport. I'd just like to say it's quite daunting. I've never been in a room where it's so many women. So my background is HR and I've been in HR for over 30 years. And I've often, throughout my career, I've often been the only woman in the room. So my job as an HR director was globally to look at organisations, our organisations that we worked in, and to try and create the ladder that we've talked about, and whether it's policy, targets, and each area was different. And I think the thing about being an HR director was one size does not fit all, and every organisation is, is very complex. So um, I hope I'm the proof that you can come from, you don't have to come from politics. So I still um, don't see myself as a politician and every day I have to remind myself, what am I here? Am I doing enough for, for women, for the area? And um, I think I'd like to demonstrate and after the five years show that you can come from an organisation not involved in politics. Many of you here are in organisations where you can't be political, whether you're a teacher or whether you work for local government or, as I did, whether you work for multinational energy companies. And I, the reason I got involved was, I think my kick up the pants um, was the yes-no, the, the, the referendum. And I, I just got upset because I had a job where people had to get on with the day job and leaders were telling people what to vote. And it got really toxic. And I just thought, it shouldn't be like this. You shouldn't be bringing your politics to work. And I think that was the kick at the pants. And um, I, in, in terms of the, the issue for me then, in fact, there was a Holyrood magazine where Mandy Rhodes, who's a brilliant um, editor, she, she said, what was the most difficult thing for you, Tess, coming out as Tory or coming out as gay? And I, I said to her, Mandy, that's a really difficult one. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't, each different party, there's not 100% that fits. I think you have to look at your own beliefs and your own values. And it's not, every per party is not going to fit perfectly. And often you go into, an, into, a, into a party and you go, well, actually, that doesn't work and that doesn't work. And maybe they should do A, B and C and find policies that do resonate so I would actually say, don't get annoyed by um, going into a party and going, it needs to be better than this. If you actually think it needs to be better than this, then you're actually right going into that. So my journey, I think the point about stand, stand and stand, I think I, I just was always sitting in the wings. So in 2019, 
I, li I live in the northeast, but I was working in London. Anybody in the oil industry in the energy sector knows it's, it's boom and bust. And I was down in London, and somebody said to me, Tess, would you like to stand for Dundee? And I just said, oh, well, I haven't got, you know, I can't do this and I can't do that. And women always find reasons why you can't do something. They just went, Tess, please, we'd just like you to do it. It's a great team. And I just thought, right, OK, I'll do it. And I met the team and I just thought, I really feel comfortable with those people and I really feel energised. And so that was the start of my journey. And then I got involved with, um, uh, in our party, every party has uh, groups. Ours was Women to Win and conservative women's organizations and they do these trial events debating and I just went and I thought well I'll just go and sit at the back and often we as women we sit at the back and then over the years I just got more confidence to actually said well would you like to have a go at making a speech so I did and it was the support of the other women and the thing about the, the uh, elector as well so I got involved in the parliament project before elector because a lot of women we always find as I say reasons why we can't do something and so being an HR, I need to make sure I did a huge gap analysis of all the things I didn't know. And then I plugged those gaps, whether it was through Women to Win or Conservative Women's Organization or Parliament Project in Elector, 50-50 Parliament. And I just, I just absorbed myself. And I know that there's a yin and a yang to everything, and I will end on this. The COVID came, and it was very, very damaging. But actually, without COVID, I wouldn't have put myself forwards because I didn't have the job I could go and knock on doors I, I was able to learn with zoom I was able to do a lot of the campaigning over the telephone and it suited me and I think that's the issue is a lot of our campaigning is done on a Saturday morning when a lot of mums and parents take their children to whether it's football or whatever and I think one of the things that COVID did for me was it changed completely the whole way that we thought about campaigning. And so I would actually say, now coming to here, is we need in our own parties and our own organisations to think about the different ways that we can actually connect with the population. And the other thing is, you are good enough. The one thing that Elector says, and it really resonates with me, is if you, if you care, you can. And I think networks like this are a wonderful um, support. And, and to quote the presiding officer, just don't give up. Uh, stand, stand, and stand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Pam Duncan Glancy, MSP, member of the Scottish Labour Party and regional member for Glasgow, to share her journey into politics. Thank, thank you very much, um, President Officer. I, my, my journey into politics um, started actually from a question I was asked in my modern studies class in sixth year. And the, the teacher at the time looked about the class and probably saw me as the person that looked a bit different from everyone else. Um, I, I grew up in a rural area in a very small school. Um, about nearly 30 years ago, this would have been. And uh, sh he said, um, do you believe in positive action? And I said, no, I want to get a job on the basis of merit. <laughs> and then I went home and my mum said, how did you get on at school today? I said, oh, it was really good. Modern studies, great, love it. Um, I was asked about positive action and I said, um, I don't believe in it because I want a job because of my merit. And my mum looked at me in utter disgust. And she was like, what are you talking about? A young working class disabled woman needs every single advantage you can get because you're going to face every single disadvantage um, that, that, that is unimaginable. And it was at that point that I realised, a bit like what Talat said earlier on, about the need for sometimes us to have legislative change to make things happen. And so that's when I started to look at things politically. Um, I then went to, um, tried to get into university, got in, but couldn't attend because there wasn't a care package in place or accommodation for me. So I had to keep deferring my university place, um, despite having got the grades in, in fifth year. And my mum said, well, you're not hanging about here doing nothing. So you either get a job or you go back to school. Um, so I, I tried to apply for a job um, in a local office. And they said, oh, the job's no longer available. So I said, OK. And then my mum went up and they offered it, my mum the job. So on the Monday morning, my mum took me in my manual wheelchair at the time up to the office and said, Pam's here to start work. And they kind of looked at her as if to say, well, wait a minute, we didn't give, we didn't give her the job. And my mum said, no, we're going to job share. She'll do half the week, I'll do the other half. 
And at that point, I realised the importance of being in the room because the people who had at first disregarded any potential that I might have to do the job, which was incidentally answering telephones, which if, for anyone who knows me, I'm all right at the chat. So I thought, I, I don't see why I couldn't do that. Um, and it wasn't until I, until I saw that, uh, until that happened that I realised discrimination is real and being in the room matters. Um, then I got to uni eventually, two years late, and someone approached me, um, Kelly Curtin, uh, and, and I'll, I'll name her because she's a wonderful woman who, um, who probably is responsible for me ending up here in some way, um, came across the, the university corridor and said to me, eh, we're looking for someone to be the disabled students officer and you look like you might be interested, <laughs> right? So I thought, well, that, that, that's pretty diplomatic. Um, I said, I've never really represented anyone um, before. I'm just here to study psychology, do my four years, get my degree and go and be a psychologist. And obviously that didn't happen. Um, so she said, well, just come along to the student union tonight. We're discussing the plans for um, the revamp of the, the, the bar, of which I had a significant interest. And <laughs> I said, I, I'd said I'd go along, listen to what was happening. And the plans were laid out on the table. And it was all kind of very technical. And it was architects. And there was chat about all that. And I was getting a bit. And then someone mentioned, and then there's a lift. And you'll ask for the key. And then they'll take, and I, I went, wait a minute, a key? So why has the lift got a key in it? Like, is everyone else just walking in and out? And they're like, yeah. And I said, so how come disabled people need a key? Like, what are you doing? Unlocking and locking their entrance. I don't understand this. And again, I was the only person who'd made that representation. And I thought, OK, now I get what Kelly meant. And actually, I can see why it's important. And that's where I got involved in party politics. Because at the time, um, and today's not the day um, for party politics, so I, I certainly won't make a pitch, but at the time, um, there, there was a Labour government, and they had just changed some of the rules around disabled students allowance and I thought they were good I thought they were really helpful and so I started to get involved in the local um labor students club so like co-cab I got involved in politics pol like with a capital p I guess um as a student and that you know that has driven my passion for politics ever since and I overwhelmingly recognized then as I met with other disabled people that there was something really empowering about being in the room with other people who look just like you and that, effectively, is what shaped my politics and, and got me here. Um, I, like others, have stood in various selections. Um, I have stood and failed in pretty much every election apart from this one. Um, and I think that's the story of a lot of women because I was interested in, Tess, your point about a gap analysis. I can't imagine a single man in politics who's ever considered that they might have a gap in their knowledge. Um, and so the fact that... <laughs> Uh, the fact that women just recognise that, I think, gives us the, um, the, the power, but also um, the permission to be here, because we understand that we don't know everything. We're not the monopoly of wisdom, but we know a bit more than they do. <laughs> um, but that, in fact, our own experience, wherever that starts and stops, um, is what makes us um, good to be in rooms like this. And so that's, that's how I got involved in politics. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I now invite Maggie Chapman, MSP, member of the Scottish Green Party and regional member for North East Scotland, to share her journey into politics. Maggie. Thanks very much. And hello, everybody. It's, it's lovely to be here. And can I begin by just giving a shout out to Aberdeen? I know folk are gathered in Aberdeen from the city and, and the Shire, and just to say hello, hello to them. Being a woman in politics is, is tough. Um, as Talat alluded to in, in, in her opening speech, there are things that we experience as women that no man in the same position ev ever has to consider about our behaviour, about what we look like, about how we, how we come across. Um, but, but actually, in so many ways, th that toughness is, I think, well, it pales into insignificance when, when I think about the honour and the privilege that it is to be an elected representative, to, ha to make use of the voice that I've got for the people that, that elected me to, to represent them. And I, I suppose I never saw myself as going into politics. I was born and brought up in Zimbabwe. Um, I lived in, in Zimbabwe for all of my child, uh, childhood education. I left when I was 19. But growing up there with the backdrop of apartheid in South Africa, growing up in a post-colonial uh, state, I was very aware that politics mattered. Um, I wasn't quite sure exactly what, 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 what all the party stuff necessarily 
why that was so important or why that needed to be so important, but politics definitely mattered. Politics was about injustice and seeing injustice, seeing inequalities very, very close and upfront and in your face every single day, I think gave me a, a very, very clear sense of just how much, how much work there was to do in the world. One of my strongest political memories as, as a teenager, I was 14, and we were visiting family in South Africa and Chris Harney was assassinated. Chris Harney was a member of the South African Communist Party and an ANC freedom fighter. And he, he, was, he was shot um, for his political beliefs. And I remember my family, um, pe people around us, the conversations changed and people thought, actually, yeah, this politics thing, it really does matter. There's something in it. People are willing to die for it. People are willing to give up everything for, for it. And that, that has a very, very, that made a very, very lasting Im impression on me. And I suppose taking, taking that sense of fighting injustice, of challenging injustice, that, that, that has galvanized pretty much everything I, I've, I've tried to do. I never thought, as I said, of politics as being something that I wanted, wanted to do, wanted to go into. I came to Scotland to study. I went to Edinburgh University to study zoology, and I thought after three or four years, I'd be back in the African bush as a conservationist. That was the plan. Um, that was 25 years ago, and I'm not there, clearly. Um, but but that, that kind of sense, I think, also instilled in me by both my mum and my dad, who uh, they had two daughters, two, two daughters in what was socially quite a conservative uh, environment, and yet they never told us to do something the way we should do it because we were girls. And I, and I think that, that also, I, I give them credit in, in many ways for that too. So that sort of political backdrop, um, the, the sense of you can do this and you should, you should think of being able to do this made me get involved in activism, in campaigns, in social justice campaigns, in things like the Make Poverty History campaign in, in the run-up to, to the change of the, of the millennium. But in the early 2000s, um, the Iraq war w was really what uh, flipped a switch for me. An illegal war, a war that resulted in the catastrophic destruction of life and of lives um, for so many people, the, and the ramifications we are still feeling today, that made me join the Scottish Greens, because they were the only party standing resolutely for peace. And not just peace because peace was nice, but actively building and making peace in different ways. And that led me to be involved in party campaigning for, for, for the first time. I got involved in, in various, various local campaigns. And then in 2007, a proportional representation at local government level in Scotland for the first time came about. And I was asked to stand, and actually Alison and I were two of the first three Greens ever elected to Edinburgh City Council in 2007. So I was a councillor for eight years, and, but, but alongside that, doing other things as well. I was a lecturer, I worked in the third sector, and saw politics as something to do, but not the only thing that I could do to, to deliver the kinds of changes, to campaign for the kinds of things I, I wanted to see. But one thing led to another, and I stood, stood for election, like others, um, also have lost probably more elections than, than I've won, but stood for election in 2016 for the North East, didn't get in that time, stood again five years later, and was elected in, in 2021. And I am determined to spend what time I, I've got in this place causing as much trouble as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maggie. I would now like to invite Councillor Hal Osler, who represents the Scottish Liberal Democrat Party in the City of Edinburgh Council, to tell I, us I'm, about her. I'm really hoping my sheer terror doesn't shine through because I am absolutely petrified. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. I thought long and hard about taking part in this. It was an honour to be invited, but this is so unbelievably outside my comfort zone. I usually appear a bit further up the road, you know, there's 63 of us. We had full council on Thursday. It's hard enough standing up in front of 62 of your fellow elected members. I cannot tell you what it feels like to have all these eyes put on you just here at the moment. I'm delighted to see 
three fellow councillors sitting here, which has given me an awful lot of sort of support. So I'm very grateful to see three of you here because you understand how terrified I am. Why did I stand? To be totally honest, there's a lot of reasons, but the thing that pushed me over the edge was I lost a bet to a friend. <laughs> I'll explain that. It's not a flippant thing. It's a really important thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I lost a bet to a friend. Um, that was the thing that pushed me over the edge. I have always been a community-based individual and I've always been a supporter. I have never been a front runner. I've always been the person that somebody else stands in front, I stand behind them and I get the job done. I've never wanted to have the credit. I've never wanted to be the person everyone looks at. I've never wanted to stand in front of people because I would automatically be looking over my shoulder to see who they were looking at. That's the type of person that I am. And I was really deeply frustrated like um, Alison and, and Maggie, who came the same route that I'm at at the moment, I started, you know, as a community individual, I wanted to get change in my local community. I was born elsewhere, raised elsewhere, and my family live overseas. If I'm truly honest, I'm actually, you know, born here in the UK for nationality. I know that's a very hot topic at the moment, but, you know, that was me a number of years ago. I moved to Scotland because my husband was from here. He used to talk about his childhood, how fantastic it was. He painted this idyll. And when we decided to have a family, we had to decide where we were going to live. And I was going, I want to go to that place where you grew up, because that sounds fab. So we did. We moved here, we raised two children, and they've had a fantastic life. It came to a certain point where I really wanted to give back. I want to make sure that the city remains the welcoming, wonderful environment that welcomed me in and gave my family a really good start. My children have now left, they've gone elsewhere, but they will always have a home and they will always have somewhere they identify with. And that is really fundamental. When you don't come from somewhere and the world is your oyster, that sounds fantastic, but it's actually very difficult because you don't fit in. And it's really important that this city understands all the different types of people that come from here. One of the first questions I got asked when I moved here is, what school did I go to? I didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> why, was so in, so why was so many people interested in my schooling? You know, I went to a small school. I grew up in the country. I went to a school, small school in the middle of nowhere. I didn't realize how people identify you, you know. So there was all these sorts of things that I was just an anathema to me and so on. So anyway, it comes to a conversation with a friend. I was so frustrated. I was a community councillor. I wanted to get some small things done in my community. And this is not a criticism of the individuals who were elected in the ward that I now represent. It was not their fault. They kept saying, well, that's lovely, but no, no, no. And all I ever heard was no. And I found that deeply frustrating. So we did the old poacher come gamekeeper thing. I switched sides. I stopped being a representative of the community. I went the other way. And I realized it's not easy. When you're elected, you think it's really, you know, you think and you look on the outside, oh, I could do that. It is not easy. It is really difficult. There are challenges every single day. But that doesn't stop us from actually achieving things. It's always about looking at something, and I always look at it as being a big hill. There's one step, two steps, three steps. Don't look at the big hill. Whatever you do, never look at the big hill. You know, just look at what's in front of you. And the most fantastic thing I can give you as a piece of advice is gather as many different opinions around you. Always invite people into the tent, because quite frankly, we need to. We really do need to work together. I work across party with a lot of individuals, and I've had really, really good experiences doing that. There's more that unites us than divides us. And it is really important. We do stand shoulder to shoulder. And the one last bit I'll leave you with is, we also do stand on the shoulders of giants. Many people have come before us. Many people will come after us. And what was so right that was said earlier is, don't shut the door behind you. Extend an olive branch. It doesn't matter whatever party. It doesn't matter. We do need more representation. And what we need is we need representation at every level. If you're on the community side, reach out to everybody, whatever level you're at, always reach out. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Hal. I think it's fair to say you seem very, very much at ease in this chamber. <laughs> um,
thank you to all our, our colleagues for sharing their personal journeys. It's now your opportunity to put questions to them. I believe we're using technology as well here. Oh, and the questions are flowing in. So. Okay. I'll just, I'm just going to start from, from this end and work out, and I'll probably, I may not put every question to every panellist because obviously we'll, we'll not have as much opportunity then. Um, okay, CoCab, I'll put this question to you. How do you think women with mental health issues could become more involved in Scottish politics? And how can we impact the stigma around mental health? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there is still uh, an enormous amount of stigma around mental health. We discuss mental health quite a lot in the Parliament. We've had uh, various motions put forward. Uh, the Scottish Government comes up with strategies and we discuss those. And one of the things that I do notice when I'm sitting over there, as opposed to over here, um, is that as politicians, we're all very good at talking about mental health and calling it out. But I'm not sure that when we leave the chamber, how that transfers over. Um, because even in this environment, um, and today it's just absolutely wonderful to uh, see everybody here, and just as an aside, for me, um, being only one of two women of colour in this place, um, and it's often quite lonely in here, today is just an absolute joy to have so many women of colour in here. So thank you so much for turning up and making me feel uh, not alone in that sense. Um, but with mental health, um, it is transferring it over into our actions. So whilst we can put in money, and there could always be more, while we can have strategies and policies, and they could always be better, what I'm finding is that it's the culture and it's the language that is used as well. And we have had some very recent examples of people using language that actually sort of like feeds that stigma um, that goes along uh, with mental health. So on the one hand, we recognise it and we know it's there and it's a huge barrier. But then on the other hand, are we really changing our language? Are we really changing our practices? Because that's what we need to do, our culture. So we need to work on that, all of us collectively. But in the meantime, I would say that um, there are many, many people suffering from uh, mental health challenges, and especially post-COVID, that has come to light even more at every level of society. Um, and for women in particular, remember the barriers they're facing are intersectional already, so they will already be dealing with issues of poverty, of uh, childcare, of precarious work. Um, uh, they may be of colour, they may have uh, different abilities. So mental health on top of that is another it's like the hammer that just keeps hammering away on, you know, it's just awful. So I think the support mechanisms to get those around you um, and ask for the help. And I think that we are getting a bit better at asking for the help. And maybe perhaps what needs to happen is that the systems need to catch up with when people are reaching out for that help and they do that. I think I'll put that question to Pam too and then I'll move on to the next question. Thank you. I, I think it's an, the culture point that CoCab's raised is really, really important and I thought it was quite refreshing to hear recently um, Kevin Stewart talk about the impact of the job on his mental health and making ultimately a bit of a, quite a sacrifice in doing what he did but hopefully it will empower others to understand that, do you know what, we're human. And it is hard. It really is hard. And, and I know Talit said earlier on that, you know, we'll try and keep everybody up today, and we will. But there's, th this, this job is difficult because every, th every single thing you do, rightly, is high stake. Everything. Look, everywhere you go, everyone you speak to, every meeting you're in, every decision you take, every vote you make, all of those. That sounds like a song. Um, the, all of these things matter. And so... It can be quite cumulative. And yesterday, actually, um, I had uh, quite, a, as, as we all do, um, various different uh, things going on, very busy day, and so, someone said to me, it's actually like you're living your life in Grand Theft Auto. And I was like, I don't know what you mean. She's like, well, it's as if somebody says, right, level up, next level, next level, next level. And actually, I, I thought, God, I really relate to that. I really, really relate to that. 
And so that in general, even if you just take the kind of baseline, is hard going. But if you have any additional mental ill health on top of that, not least caused by or exacer uh, exacerbated by work, and this is work, um, and we all know that work can have an impact on our mental health. You, you layer anything on top of that, it's really, really hard. So I think um, we need to do a few things. First of all, I think we need to be kinder to one another, really, really, really kinder to one another. Um, and I try and check myself regularly about that because we can get quite carried away, particularly in the chamber. Um, and I know the presiding officer is regularly telling us all to behave because of the way um, that things can, can escalate. So I think that's really important. I think we must be kinder to each other. I think we have to understand that people in all walks of life, including in politics, are human beings. And I've often wondered, it's like there's a bit of a kind of identity crisis at times because people, the public expect politicians to be like them. So if you're different, they're like, oh, they're out of touch. But then if you're like them and you have the same sort of, I can't think of another word, not um, like vulnerabilities as other people, then you're not, you don't always get forgiven as a politician for showing a vulnerability. And that's, that's difficult. And actually that's on all of us, but including politicians, to be leaders in that and to say we're trying. And also it goes back to the point that was made earlier on about trust in politics. That's really, really important because if people don't trust politics, then they find it hard to give anyone the benefit of the doubt. And all of that together, I think, um, can be quite difficult. So we need to be kinder. I also think that we need to encourage people to, to take time to take a break if they need to. Um, and we've all got a responsibility to do that. And lastly, um, I think it's important to reach across particularly political divides um, and, and just show one another that we're all here to do what we think is the right thing. And most of us are in this job because we want to make, make change happen. And we should recognise that and support people to do that um, much, much more. Thank you, Pam. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, so I'm probably going to. We've got so many good questions coming in that I may just give you a, que a question each, and I can tell that everybody wants to be involved in every question. Um, but yeah, we just can't. <laughs> I was on this panel the last time, so I appreciate how difficult it is. Um, I'm going to put this question to Tess. How do female politicians cope when they are whipped to vote along their party lines that would not align with their own values or conscience? Thank you. Presiding officer, I will answer that question, but I'm actually going to apply politicians' privilege to say a couple of words on the previous. So, and I will be brief. So, I sit on the um, committee for public health, women's health, and sport. And the reason we need more women in politics is because we are at the bottom of the tree regarding mental health. Talking about pelvic floor health, talking about mental health, postpartum. Uh, uh, we have a petition going through on postpartum psychosis, menopause, when you hit menopause. And I think the one thing that I really feel passionate about is we need to shift the dial, that we, we, we don't talk about contraception, we don't talk about periods, we don't talk about the impact of periods on sport. And all those things are really important, and I think there is an effect on mental health. So I just I do want to say that, so that's why we need more. In terms of the whip. I feel I was, a, I was a deputy whip. I was privileged to be in the whips team because I learned such a lot. Part of that is making sure that you only whip your party for um, very, very, um, for not moral issues. And um, I think that certain parties failed their, part, their, their own members by whipping uh, particular votes when there should have been free votes. And Alison, you've asked the right person for this one because it's very important. Thank you. That's another reason why we need more women in the uh, business as business managers, as your gender audit has highlighted. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be very interested. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, the bureau within Parliament, I think it's we've only ever attained 40% women when there has been a presiding officer on the bureau. So that's certainly something that will be covered with the work that the audit will progress. Maggie, here's a question. Being an MSP requires an understanding of law. Legis legislative scrutiny cannot be robust without that. How are women supported to develop and grow these skills once elected? That, that's a great question. And, and I suppose there, there are lots of different ways in, in which 
um, that, that, that growing of knowledge and awareness happens. I don't think any of us who aren't lawyers, who don't have le a legal background, would, would claim to be experts or to, to know the ins and outs at all. And those who do claim that probably are wrong. Um, but, but, but I think, I think there are different ways. For, for me, for me that the legislation is about what it enables. What's the social uh, point of that legislation? Sorry, what, what, what is, what is the, the consequence of that legislation being passed? And so, so the purpose of legislation is, is what, what, for me, is absolutely vital. Within this place, within the Parliament, when we are scrutinising laws, we have support. We have support from legal uh, people with, with legal backgrounds. We have support from researchers and, and from others who can, who can explain how that, how that very... Um, technical legalese gets translated into reality on the ground, or how, how that legalese should get translated into reality on the ground. So, so, so for me, it, it's not about having a detailed understanding of the law in its entirety. It's about understanding the implications and the consequences of the legislation that we develop and we create. And the scrutiny, role, the scrutiny powers that we have Bringing in experts to support us in that scrutiny is vital. As others have said, you know, none of us can do the job we do on our own. We, we, all, we have an office of, of staff, of, of, of folk who support us. But beyond that, it's the experts, the, the legal experts in Parliament. It's the, the committee clerks. It's the uh, researchers and experts in, in our information centre that actually give us the tools to better understand the consequences of what we're doing. So... The 129 MSPs that are elected to this place, when we leave at the end of our term, we are not experts in, 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 in law, but we should have a very thorough understanding of the consequences, the, the, the sort of real-life consequences of the laws we make. Thank you very much, Maggie. A question to Hal. How would you empower young girls who are still at school to get involved in politics? And do you think this should be embedded within the Scottish curriculum? I do. One of the most terrifying things I've ever done is go and appear in front of a bunch of rainbows. If you've never been questioned <laughs> by five-year-olds, it is the most frightening experience that I've ever had. I was questioned by one of my local troops, and after three quarters of an hour, the actual leader turned around and said, that's, en that, that's enough now. <laughs> You know, they were five to seven years old, and I was so amazed. And I actually left that group meeting thinking to myself, the future's looking pretty good. There's some really strong females out there. And my job is to make sure they stay that way, is that they stay that enthused, that as a local individual, which is what I am, I go out and meet lots of groups. I go to schools, I talk to modern studies, you know, I talk to lots of individuals because I came from the communities and I want to empower more individuals to actually come through that way and hear local voice. The reason being is that, you know, I represent a ward of about 25,000 people. You know, I live in one part of it, but I don't live in all of it. You know, I go around, I knock on people's doors, I go and ask them, this is your area. What do you want to see? How can I enable that for you? That's my job. And it's really important to give people that power to change. But I highly recommend, if you ever want to stand, go and talk to your local rainbow group because they can give you lots of ideas of things to work on. And whatever you do, never litter. Never litter. They really <laughs> don't like litterers. You know, you know they, they really, really think that the way that we treat our environment is absolutely horrific. So, you know, a word out there, get your litter picks out like this and then you'll be fine. Thank you very much. The, the fabulous questions keep flowing in. Cocab, I'm going to, to put this question to you. And this is really just seeking an understanding or any advice or your experience of coping with threats on social media, if that's something you've experienced, if it is becoming very unpleasant. Um, yeah, I mean, 
It is. I mean, it is a huge, huge uh, issue. It is becoming bigger. And I suppose from a personal point of view, from somebody like me, there's no hiding for me. You know, in that sense, I'm, on the one hand, I'm very visible by the very nature of the uniqueness of myself. And I will pay tribute to Pam Gosal as well, the other woman of colour in this place. Um, but from my point of view, I can't hide, but in, in other areas, I, I know that I am still invisible and I'm still sort of like carving out those spaces. Uh, the expectations, I find, there's a mismatch. Um, people either have very low expectations of me, um, and it was said when I got elected, uh, it was, you know, there was a lot of media attention around it and things, and people uh, said, well, Cocap, you know, there's so much more to you than just being a BAME woman. And I thought, yeah, you're right. I've always known that. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out to me. Um, I continue to sort of uh, speak up on race equality in amongst my passion for education, in amongst my passion for doing something about retrofitting of tenemental properties, which is a huge issue in my constituency, um, and active travel transport. So I'm giving, I'm saying those things because I have opinions on all of those things, um, but I am also interested in race. I might not be, and I reserve the right as a woman of colour not uh, to have that as an area of specialism, but, you know, I am interested. So when you speak up that, when you're uh, challenging the status quo, you become a target. And because, as uh, my colleague Pam said, you know, uh, we, we are legislators, we are discussing hot topics, we are discussing often um, in a very heated way, the, uh, robust debates take place. And you have to pick a side. You, you know, you're sort of representing the party, you're representing yourself, you're representing all the other people that are trying to influence that. So you're going to be controversial. And somebody like me who is here to do the work and the hard work, you end up being in controversy when you didn't even see it coming. Because, of course, the media then uh, often very anonymous. You know, people sort of say things that are hiding behind. Um, and the effect of that, I always think, would they say that to you in real life? And the chances are they probably wouldn't, because then you have to put the human face to it. And I think on social media what's happened is that that screen and this bit here has dehumanized all of us, actually. But politicians and female politicians and black female politicians, and I'm thinking of Diane Abbott here, um, you know, uh, I mean, absolutely off the scale the amount of abuse that she receives. So we get stuck in that space where we know we have to raise our heads above the parapet, but we also know that that is going to draw attention and it's going to be hostile. And I mean, yes, I, I have to say that the racism that I uh, face online, um, I unfortunately have had to get the police involved in a few incidents which have had to be investigated. Um, and uh, the, the security support services at the parliament, I have to pay tribute to them. They are very supportive. You get uh, full sort of briefings on your own personal security and how to take care of that. But unfortunately, it is something that we have to be mindful of. What I would say is do not be silenced, because if I'm being honest, I think there, ha there are times when I feel as though actually it would be easier not to say something. And you have to have that strength to power through because you cannot let people uh, of that kind of nature, that kind of hostile, abusive, very personal racism off the scale um, and, and Islamophobia. And ironically, I get it from both sides because I also get the bit about that I'm not Muslim enough. Um, and I also get the bit about I'm not Pakistani enough. Um, <laughs> So whichever bit that I land in, <laughs> and what's interesting is other people making those judgments. So the intersectionality and the nuances, um, and we're not a homogenous group, none of that is picked up by social media or the press or what, you know, they don't have time for that. Um, so, but what I'm saying to you is do not let that, uh, it is upsetting, it is hard, but the support is there cut through it and stick to your line, stick to your message and don't give in on that at all. And 
switch off the media and as somebody said, I think it was Talat Reese very recently said, don't look under the line and I'm looking about Twitter, you read the headline, don't click into the comments because nothing good will be found there. <laughs> I think that's wholly sound advice. <laughs> I used to know when people in my family were reading below the lines. This is in the days before Twitter, if they were reading the evening news comments. Yeah. Just by the, the, yes, don't do it. Um, this is a question that's coming for Pam. And the question, Pam, is what are your biggest challenges as a disabled MSP? And how did you manage preparing for your access needs to be met in Parliament? Um, Thank you, that, that's a really good question. Um, the, so actually, how do you manage? I know I said this a minute ago, but there really is something that feels quite, quite relentless. It's always like you have to keep, like, things do seem quite cumulatively uh, hard. And as a disabled person, um, there are two things that you need if you don't have an equal access to the world, which we know we don't as disabled people. Um, and if access is difficult, time and information are really important. And time is in very short supply in this job. Um, actually, in most work, if I'm honest, like I think in society in general, time is um, in short supply these days. And information is crucial. So the, the, the thing that helped me um, prepare for access and getting the job, I'll be honest, was, was the parliament, actually. And I remember being elected about, it was about half past six on the Saturday night in the Emirates in Glasgow, because the second I was elected on the list and the count went into the Saturday. I was the last um, region uh, to be counted and the last person on the list to get in, so it was literally the last bit. And quite overwhelmed, all the rest of it, as you might imagine in the moment, went out to get in my van to go back home and sort of take it all in. And I think I'd been in the van 10 minutes, my sister was driving, and my phone rang. So I answered it, didn't recognise the number, and um, I can't remember the woman's name, but she was incredible. I said, hello, I'm phoning from the parliament to sort out your induction. <laughs> I was like, right, I've only been elected 25 minutes. Um, and it was at that point where I thought, wow, this is, this is it. Like, this is, this is actually it. Like, but actually, on, on that call, I was asked, what am I going to need in the next week? I'm going to be staying over. Accommodation that was fully accessible had been booked for me. They'd already earmarked an office, which was, they thought, an easier office in the building for me to have. And I've stayed there because it was. Um, they had already looked at um, rise and fall desks, made sure that the proximity in the office to, to different plugs and such were, was possible for me. And they'd arranged for someone to accompany me in the first week so that I could go around with, with um, basically just be shown around, like orienteered around the place. And... At first, I thought, that's a bit, that's a shame. This poor person's basically got to hang about with me all week. And, and I didn't realise how important that was, though, because this parliament, I think, is actually quite accessible. But if you'd asked me before I was a parliamentarian, I would have probably said it can be quite inaccessible. And that goes back to the point I made earlier about time and knowledge, because you need to know the accessible routes to be able to, to enjoy them but you need time as well. So like, I'm, I'm always late for everything. And then I try and build it into my day. Um, but there'll be times where I'm sure the presiding officer's noticed where I'm literally screeching to my seat in time for questions. Because if everyone else is using the lift, which, by the way, is fine, I'm, I'm not the lift police, um, it, you, know, you have to wait. So actually, you end up cumulatively adding a few minutes on to pretty much every interaction in your day as a disabled person. So having this person there to show me around really mattered because everyone else who was new in the parliament... Um, would be following each other, but I would be following them to the bottom of a staircase or following them, so it really helped. What I would say is um, that kind of approach and that kind of proaction about the sort of, you would call it in legal terms, reasonable adjustments you'd put in place, you shouldn't have to be an MSP to get that, to get into the workplace. It shouldn't have had to be the fact that you need to be one of only 129 people in the country doing a job that means you get your access requirements met 25 minutes after you're offered the job. Um, people should be able to expect that um, as, as a matter of course, in any workplace um, and in fact in any interaction they have in society. Um, and so I'd like to thank the Parliament staff for doing that, but also encourage other employers to, um, to try to be as good as that too. Thank you very much, Pam. I am very conscious of time, but I'm keen to put another question to to Hal, Maggie and to Tess too. So I'm just going to work here very quickly, but I am going to put on my
presiding officer hat and ask for speedy responses. So if we could keep it to a minute or so, that would be grand because we've got a lot of other, you know, interesting work that we want to protect and, and enjoy too. So Hal, there's a question in here from well, someone who describes themselves as a, as, a, as a mature woman. What can we do to tackle ageism in politics? As a mature woman, I face this from both women and men, especially from those in council and government. Wow. <laughs> yeah, um, that is a bit of a difficult one. I'm a woman of a certain age, and um, the difficulty and the most liberating thing I had when I got elected is I lost my title of Mrs. or Ms. or Ms. I became councillor. I became exactly the same as 62 other individuals. And I didn't actually appreciate how liberating that would be. And it was a very important lesson for me because I watch as individuals, I've got two daughters and I watch as individuals come forward and you know, I've got relatives of an older age. We have to make everything accommodating for everybody. And we don't walk in the same shoes. We've all had different life experiences. And what was so well put out earlier is we do not close the door behind us to anybody, to anybody. And that includes individuals from an older age. Because the way that we can be a more tolerant society is to bring everybody with us. Mm -hmm. And when I said about people standing on the shoulders of giants, I'm very, very aware that I live in a mixed sort of generation of where when I came through, you were Mrs. or Miss or this. You, you changed your title. You changed your identity. People who didn't, it was a bit kind of like, ooh, who do you think you are? You know, and so on. So this business of it having gone forward and people keeping their names like that, I think is really, really, really fantastic. Liberating, you should be who you wish to be. But we have to have an understanding is that's not the same for everybody who came before you. So we have to make sure that, especially in things like digital exclusion, how we operate now, we use an awful lot of things like iPads, and I don't know about here, but at the council level, we have goodness knows how many passwords. I mean, the one thing you don't want to do is give lots of councillors passwords, because without fail, we can't remember half of them, we can't access documentation. It is really, really important that we make things accessible, but we make it things accessible for everybody, and we do cut down those barriers. I don't have an answer, I wish I did, because we're still, still learning. All we can do, though, is to encourage everybody to come forward. If you see there's a difficulty, you let us know. It is our responsibility to change that, because as a society, we have to be represented by everybody. You all need to see people that look like you represent you, no matter who, where, why, what you are. You know, it is so important that you feel there's somebody there that understands partially the shoes that you walk in on a daily basis. Thank you very much, Mark. I'll put this question to Maggie. What advice do you have to anyone struggling with imposter syndrome? Gosh, I mean, that, that, in, in some ways that, that's a big question. And I, and I suppose one, one of the things that I think we probably all share is we all share in that sense of imposter syndrome. Are we good enough? Do we deserve to be here? Because we are told repeatedly from other people, sometimes people in our own party, sometimes people in this chamber, that we shouldn't be here, that we're not good enough, that we don't deserve our seats in, in, in this place. So, so I, I, think, I think there is solidarity in that shared frustration of, of experience, um, of, be, of experiencing that, that imposter syndrome. And, and I suppose in terms of advice, I would say, I was going to say three things, but it might, it might be two. Um, the, 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 fir the first thing to say is, as Kokab said earlier uh, in, in answer to the question about online abuse, you know, power through. You, you do have a legitimate role here. You do have a legitimate place here. And there are people who want you to succeed. Focus on them. Focus on the people who want you to be there, who want you to succeed. And, it, and if we're talking about elected representatives, the people who voted you in. You know, all of us are sitting in the seats we're sitting in because people voted us into those seats of power. That itself is, is, is an endorsement of, of who we are and, and what we stand for. The second piece of advice is actually to, to, to look, at, look at it for, for other people and Look at other women in positions of, of leadership, in positions, or thinking about positions of leadership and saying, I believe in you, you can do it. Because that's how we can support each other. That's how we can build more rungs on that ladder Talat was talking about earlier and 
get even more people up on, on, on the ladder behind us. I believe in you. I believe you can do this. And yeah, you'll have really, really shitty days. We all do. But you get up the next morning and you keep going because that's, that's what we do. And you do that with people, with, with your friends and, and, and sisters and others who are there next to you, standing in solidarity. Thank you, Maggie. I'm going to put this final question to Tess. And it is, what support mechanisms are in place for women of faith in politics? Where do I draw the line between my faith and public service? Wow. That's a really heavy one. Um, so faith, I would actually say, is faith is personal. Um, uh, we have a group that comes once a week and they sit in red up there and they actually give me personally tremendous um, support just to see them sitting there and then once a week we have a prayer in Parliament and it's um, of all different faiths and I think that just gives us, it gives those who, who do have a faith or even if they don't have a faith, I wouldn't say I was particularly religious, actually it gives me comfort knowing that every single week we've got to think about peace and we've got to think about each other. So in terms of laws, we have a law coming through, a bill, a very important bill coming through um, about abortion buffer zones. Uh, we have another very important bill coming through on end of life. And I think those, there, you asked me before, Deputy Presi oh, sorry, Presiding Officer, you asked me before about faith and whipping. And I think that's where each of us as politicians have to we're being inundated right now on those two topics from our constituencies and at the end of the day as politicians I think we have a duty to ourselves and to our um, the uh, constituents that we support to listen to those uh, um, uh, the, the, the sides of the issue and at the end of the day, we sit there in the chamber and we wrap a cold towel around our head and we take a view on what we believe is right. And that's why I think having a diverse and inclusive parliament means that it should be balanced. And another reason why parties should not whip on issues of uh, morality. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Tess. So we're absolutely out of time. I have pushed, pushed it to the max, otherwise no one will have any lunch and we wouldn't want that. Um, can I just say, well, thank you for the absolutely incredible questions. For those that haven't been reached, there may be an opportunity to, to have a chat um, later. But thank you all so much for the questions and I'm sure you'll want to thank me, thank with me the fabulous panel who have answered so well. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>now I'm very, very excited about this. I'd like to invite the joyous choir to perform three songs, Bella Ciao, We Are Remembering, and Bambalella Never Give Up. The joyous choir.
cha 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 bella cha bella cha bella cha 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 git git chele diyecek merhaba merhaba ey güzel çiçek gelip git chele diyecek merhaba merhaba ey güzel çiçek we are sing
fair to say that was truly joyous from the joyous choir and what a, an absolutely fabulous high note to end this morning on. Thank you so much. I also feel your numbers may swell after that because there's a lot of people wanting to join in there. Um, can I just take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers to say thank you to Talat, to say thank you to our, our fabulous panellists who, who gave of their time and, and shared their experiences with you this morning, to thank the Joyous Choir, to thank all of you who have participated with your questions and contributions, and to say thank you too to those participating in Aberdeen, Argyll and Butte, Inverclyde, Perth and Kinross and Shetland, wherever you are watching today's events. You will be pleased to know that it is now time for lunch um, and our team here will help make sure that you get to where you need to go but I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and that's us finish this session for the moment but thank you all very much indeed for being here.